Hi, everyone, and welcome to our next segment of Moments with Mumila. I have some wonderful musicians and artists here with me. Uh, before I get started, the purpose of these conversations is to share Indigenous perspectives, experiences, and thoughts. These perspectives are not my own. I am looking to create awareness and support discussion among Indigenous people ourselves and among Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples outside of these Zoom segments. So, like I said, I have a number of artists on and and we are going to rotate and have discussion uh, with each of them. And then maybe you'll get to hear a little bit of something at, at the end. So the first individual I'm going to talk to is Elisabeth Isaac. And Elisabeth, if you could introduce yourself, that would be great. Hello, Nakormeg Momilak, Elisabeth Vonga, Elisabeth Isaac Lumiuk. I was born and raised in Saluit, Nunavik. Um, a small Inuit town, of course. Um, yeah, I left Montreal when I was around 22. Um, and then music came into my life um, as a profession quite like late in my life, I'd say 24 maybe. Um, yeah, so I've, I'm a singer songwriter um, and I do many other things. I'm a mother, um, yeah. How did you get into music? What inspired you to do that? I, I, I never know when to say I got into music, when I got into music, because, you know, when you're a small kid, a small town girl, um, even though I had amazing influences like or inspiration, like my uncle's band, Sudluk band, uh, the Dorset, uh, Cape Dorset band, who are family members also, Tayara, and a lot of music in my town. Like, um, so I always thought, you know, it's just something we do, right? Um, it's only when I heard Susan and Luca's album, um, what was it called again? Oh, her first album anyway. I was sitting there and I saw like her album and I was like her cassette. And I was so blown away because she, all of a sudden I was like, we can do this. Like we can actually, so I was a teenager. So that's really when you're like, it's like seeing something on TV and you're like, oh, I want to be like her. Before that, I didn't really have that. Um, even though we had amazing people like William Tagunak, uh, people who wrote amazing songs, Charlie Adams. Um, so yeah, it took a while and when I moved here, I started uh, really seriously consider like making music, writing my own songs. But then again, I had my brother, Charlie Dakhik, who's an amazing musician. Um, but to really think about making a, like a career or like even the word artist didn't really exist. I don't think it really does still in my, in my language anyway. So it's still something that is very, it can come in and it can just leave and I could do something else. So yeah, it took, it took a while for me to understand that notion of being a singer. Definitely. And it's interesting too, a lot of the time when we're growing up, we don't often see ourselves reflected in so many different aspects of life in music, in mm -hmm. politics, in, you know, nursing. And, you know, we don't, we, we see it more and more definitely, but it's not something that we all necessarily grew up with. Mm -hmm. How would you describe your music? I think my music is definitely very personal. First and foremost, it's something uh, very, um, it's my sort of, um, it's like something that defines my, who I am. It's the, it's probably the place where I feel most accepting of myself, um, where I feel most strong, where I feel so many things that I aspire to be when I was a kid, probably. But those feelings are very, they're pretty amazing. So it's, yeah. I, I, my music is, it, it, it's, it's changing all the time, you know, it's, it's, it, of course, it's inspired by folk music, very American sound, um, just like my uncle, like, just like they listen to, um, I don't know, Neil Young and, you know, 
Um, so there's, I, I never felt there was any traditional side to what I do, but then again, uh, singing in my language and trying to use different um, words or phrases that are very unusual for our language. Um, I love that because it, I have a feeling that people can hear things or see things differently, their own emotions. So it's hard to describe. So it's folk. It goes from rock to psychedelic. The last album I have all sorts of influences, but I'd say very close to my roots more and more. That's like my roots. I'm talking about the music that is very grounding. That is that takes the time. That is not trying to rush anything. Very much like how we are as Inuit, you know. So feel these very fine lines that I try to. Um, keep keep um i don't know how it's hard to explain how what my music is actually but uh, of course inuktitut and uh, english words are you know intertwined with french once in a while and yeah because you do make music in multiple languages right yeah i do i mean french is very rare but still i love the idea that you can express things in a very different way um yeah so i'm definitely trilingual like in anything i do i feel really comfortable in being able to adapt to different because that's who i am also i'm inuk but my biological father is from newfoundland who i got to know very much later on in my life um and i've been here among French people, or since I was a kid, actually, I I used to be the translator for my mom. So it's something she was very proud of that I, she thought it was very pretty and exotic. So it's just part of, yeah, who I am. Do you find that that changes or alters how you create or produce music in any way, depending on what, what language? Uh, I was talking uh, with another musician the other day and um, I was talking about, you know, growing up listening to Susan Aglukak and re-listening to the albums again that the English I had to relearn, but the Inuktitut, I just had to hear the melody and I could remember what, what the words were. So do you find that there's uh, any particular differences depending on the language you're writing or, or singing in? Uh, very much. I mean, my Inuktitut, songs are i i just look at the window i usually write songs in front of the window because i need to have a view of something even if it's just i don't know whatever i just need to um so inuktitut words come out usually when i think of home or when i and it's very inspiring and it's usually very painful because i've been away for so long there's usually a lot of melancholy, very, I don't know, because it's so personal. I, all of a sudden I see my little cousin or my, my cousins who committed suicide or my uncles who've gone through so much or, um, so yeah, you know, to, to songs are definitely, um, I don't know, very personal, but yet they're more for, you know, I want them to be heard and that they reach someone, you know? Um, yeah, and I try not to calculate that. I just, it just, it's the melody that will decide which emotions are, you know, which emotions they bring. And then from there, I kind of have an idea what story I want to tell, or it could be very personal or, yeah. In that, uh, were there any, points i guess within your career that really stuck out whether that it was a challenge or a barrier that you weren't sure how to or how do i say it like i get asked all the time as an enoch what it feels like to be in the house of commons did you have any kind of moments throughout your music career where it was like huh i didn't realize that that was going to be something that was going to be a challenge or a barrier for me mm -hmm. I think there are challenges, um, especially when, like, for me, I've always been someone who liked to be 
um, the way I was brought up, you know, I'm an adopted child, uh, grew up with parents who are no longer alive. My, they were older. Um, so they had, they're from another era and me being so, uh, from another era too, for, for them, like even them thinking like their daughter's going to leave, go live in Montreal is going to have a music career. Like it was like, not anything that they, they would ever imagine. So I think being in two, sorry, I thought I had to shut this off. I don't know why it's, um, being in two worlds has been definitely, you know, it's been not so much harder on what other people think of you that you're so, I don't know, you adapted so well to the Southern life or you're among Haluna and you're no longer living in the North or it's more like how, I had to um, forgive myself, you know, and say, okay, stop, you know, being so hard on yourself. So that took me a while. It took me my second child to really acknowledge that I'm way too hard on myself, you know, and also learning to accept and ask for help or to, so that was definitely the most freeing thing ever. Like, I feel like, because you know when you're a young person you 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 you're just trying to also learn about who you are or how to adapt to between two worlds so uh, it's very hard i think people tend to think that because you're inuk or you're indigenous that you know everything or that you have to support like everybody's uh, like you or you have to teach everybody it's 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 draining but um and i think when you're young also trying to do something different or uh, being very free or very independent sometimes you're like okay you you're afraid that you're going to be seeing seen as too much like oh she's she doesn't need us anymore or you know what i mean um so i think that's something that i had to deal with by myself and accept that no one will ever take away my inukness. I'm, I, I don't have to prove to anybody. I think it's, it's very freeing, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think very similarly, I get asked a lot about my face tattoos and I'm like, sorry, none of your business. <laughs> it's mine and mine alone as an inuk. If yeah. I choose to share that or not, that's, that's up to me. Imagine if you had to share that every day and talk like it's it's like yeah let's just we're all humans we just you know mm -hmm. yeah it's like we we are we have a lot of responsibility already as indigenous peoples and yeah mm -hmm. and with all that in mind are there any hopes or you know things that you would like to see in the future for indigenous peoples in in the music industry <laughs> um well in all industries actually i think music industry is the place where probably there is a lot of um movement where it's really like a lot of music all sorts of music very bold very unafraid very like breaking all the rules that's how i find music is right now for the indigenous people but i think we need to make space for us we need to see us more um on tv like our tv like here in quebec like in montreal is people are starting to talk about how it's still very white we need to change that and i think it's okay to be like hey we want change but i think it's also important that uh, non-indigenous uh, people realize that they need to make space for all colors, for all cultures. So I think in all fields, and I, I always talk about like, how about like, what if um, uh, so now, uh, education system is a little bit more creative. Let, let's say a school, my kid's school here in South Shore, Montreal could recognize um, like indigenous languages around the area uh, indigenous um, communities or even just like just learn to say a few words in that language where so people kids could really feel like okay we are you know 
this is so rich imagine like i think there's so many things that we have to do like uh, like what the kids are taught in you know history uh classes or or cultural days i think there's some changes coming so i'm really happy about that but i think we still um need to be out there and you know not just be teachers anymore we need to be creating freely and having that ability and 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 be very free about it because most of the time we have to educate when we should just be i don't know doing our art or expressing what we wanted to do is that we spend so much energy on educating which is fun you know but it'd be so nice if we, people could be more aware you know so we could really have deep conversations absolutely and i think that that's something as canadians we often take pride in canada being inclusive and diverse but when you actually look at it we're looking at the surface we're not talking about history we're not talking about you know there are so many important things that we'd like to think we're doing a good idea but there's always room for improvement and i think that something as you know not a lot of people think of this because they don't experience not seeing themselves in media not seeing themselves in all different kinds of professions and industry it's so important that we have that room to like you said teaching oh my goodness when i was going to school i was like sorry i'm 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 paying to be here to learn, not to be the teacher. Yeah. So I think that that's something that we experience all too often. And I think that there is such an immense amount of accountability and responsibility that we put on ourselves and one another sometimes as Indigenous people with that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it's amazing that we're, even though it is 2020, I think we should be a bit farther, but we're at this point where we're having these conversations. So I think it's it's really powerful. Yeah. Um, in that for yourself uh do you have anything that you would like to work towards or accomplish in in the future for for you oh my god it's, it's so many things i want to do so much more i want to go back to making films but maybe revisiting the the, the inuit stories but like modern stories also like not so long ago i'm so amazed at like or i'm kind of stuck in the 60s 70s because that's where changes came really like you know like my town was still igloos in the early 60s right it's it's crazy if you think about that so residential schools era in for where i'm from anyway 60s 70s are so many stories in there that I'm interested in, like my uncles, what what went on, you know, and also why they are the way they are now. I want to understand, and and so I think that's something I'm really interested in right now. In order to really act, maybe understand a little bit more who I am, who my family is, uh, who my community is, because we were never in one place all many of us we were you know small little um communities would you know had gathered in what we call the villages now so there's so many amazing things like uh rite of passage i don't know if we say that rite de passage but um like for, for instance tattoos or even as a kid, um, I think those, those, you know, they start very earlier on, um, all these very ceremonials that we had, we don't practice anymore, but they should be made into, because it would be, be very helpful for the kids and individuals, you know, growing up and feeling like they're guided. So I think these things have to start having their, their space in our communities. Of course, I think because of religion, um, it was replaced, you know, because of religion. But I think I'll never say don't be religious anymore, but I think we could live with both. And we don't have to feel like we have to choose. I'm talking about people who are, you know, um, going to Anglican church in my town, or I think we have to 
start making space for those very special ceremonials, you know, th that we used to have because they can easily come back like that. Look at the nature where we live. It's, they're made to be there among Inuit. So. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that uh, sharing and creating awareness and sharing experiences is so, so important. Would you care to share a little bit of a, your, your music or a little taste for us of, oh, of yeah. that? Um, I'm not going to take the guitar because you guys are going to be like, oh, she's so bad at the guitar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I could maybe share a song I wrote, one of the first songs I wrote after my postpartum depression or whatever, you know, my spirit was just like after my second baby and then with my third one, it was just so much better. I'm so much, you know. I've learned to accept happiness, you know, finally. Well, I'm, up, I'm about, I don't know. I'm happy. I feel happy. I feel like, and I think it's something that was never really, something I never really took seriously, you know, being happy and being kind to oneself. And so this song came in, um, during a very sad time and I thought about many uh, individuals out there or my cousins who passed who committed suicide and how it's so hard for Inuit to ask for help and say hey I need help or I'm not feeling well so I'll try to make it quicker because it's very long but it's called um, Ikayunga Asiyugama Unga si tu mo, hiyango ama, naluli ama, ikayo taulaw lang na, ilan yung ito, ukaw si sa toa. Hiyango ama, naluli ama, ikayo taulala. Yay! Oh, that was amazing. I love it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time and, and speaking with me. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Elizabeth. For the next little bit, we're going to talk to a friend of mine. His name is Cody Coyote. I think we met back in 2015, 16, 18, somewhere, a couple of years ago, anyways, at a, um, a We Matter campaign event. Um, and uh, yeah, so we've known each other for a little bit and we're gonna talk to Cody for the next little while. Uh, and I guess we can start with Cody, if you can introduce yourself for us. Do I mute myself? Sorry, Cody. Go for it, Elizabeth. Awesome, miigwech and uh, miigwech Elizabeth for, for sharing, you know, and uh, kitch miigwech for having me here. But uh, first and foremost, Ani bojo, kori kaiori nindishna kaz, asuno de nindishna kaz, anishna be a king in donji, ojibwe anishna be nindao matachwa ne donjiba. Um, I was just saying hello and welcome, and uh, I go by kori kaiori, but my spirit name asuno de means stone heart, so I have that strong heart. I was saying that I was born and raised on unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin territory and that I'm Ojibwe and Anishinaabe from Matachuan First Nation, which resides in Treaty 9 territory in Northern Ontario. Um, I'm a hip hop electronic artist, motivational speaker, and uh, the radio show host of The Beat, which airs Monday through Friday on Ottawa's 95.7 Element FM. Yeah, catch me good. <laughs> awesome, can you talk a little bit about how, and I, I do feel weird saying like how you got into music because realistically as a child, you can follow a beat and kids love music. So it, it's, I guess, when did you, um, can you talk to us a little bit about how you, when you, when you started your career professionally and that was something that, I guess, no, sorry, let me take it a step back. When, um, can you tell us about the time 
where you thought to yourself, you know, this is something that I want to do. This is something I want to do professionally and full time. Hmm. I'll, I'll take it back as far as even, you know, how I got into it. It was in high school. Um, my, my father introduced me into poetry and uh, it was around a time where I was being severely bullied for having long hair and uh, being indigenous. And he, he told me that I had an option, you know, with what I was writing. I could either let it go or I could do something with it. And I chose to do something with it. And it was when my teacher had come up to me in class one day and I was working on this wicked piece. Like I loved what I was writing. And he comes up to me and he's like, hey, what are you doing? I was just like, oh, I'm writing, sir. He's like, writing what? I'm like, I'm writing a poem. I thought I was going to get in trouble because I wasn't doing my work, but he told me to get up. And immediately I'm like, like around this point in my life, I had my own seat up front of the principal's office. That's kind of where I was, right? So I thought he was going to bring me to the principal's office, but instead he brought me into the studio, which was right next door to his classroom. And he's like, here, go check this out. And I saw about three of my friends in there recording a demo. And I kept going in there because he allowed me to go in there at lunch, after school, uh, even on the weekend. And it became a safe space for me to get away from bullying and get away from racism. Um, continually going in there, we ended up experimenting with like hip hop beats. And I experimented with, uh, sorry, experimented with rapping for the first time. And once I started getting that, that feel that I had in there, it was medicine all in itself. And I started to tell myself like, I wanna do this. Like, I want to do this. This is what I want to do. I don't want to do anything else. I want to make music. It makes me feel good. And um, I just continued with uh, my practice of making music. Got my own microphone, my own uh, software to work with at home. And uh, I cut my first project back in 2015. And then that ended up being up for uh, a few nominations at the Indigenous Music Awards. And that's exactly where, well, ended up being out there with Yai and Chelsea first and foremost. I don't know if they remember, but it was, it was quite awesome. And um, that's where like, I started to like really get a feel of like, this is for real. You know, this is what the end result can be, you know, and where this journey can lead. And um, I continue to make music, you know, and invest that time into my craft. But, yeah. I love it. In since that time uh, and getting more, it, it sounds like it was a very, and, and this is a conversation that has come up um, more often, what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing from Indigenous artists, Indigenous musicians, is that without these windows of opportunity, like if your teacher wasn't there, would your music career be at this point in time? You know, when Indigenous people attempt to access things in, you know, in, in multiple areas, it can be difficult. I think that those being a musician and being an artist, although I have never been one, I have lived with them. I have been very good friends with them. And it's such an immense amount of work. It is such, you, you have 100% have to be very passionate about creating your craft and, and, and altering it and putting it out there for people to, to have access to. In, since, since, you know, being in that recording studio and having done the work that you have, were, have there been any uh, barriers or challenges that you were like, oh snap, I didn't realize that that was gonna be something that I would need to overcome. Um, is there anything that kind of sticks out to you in terms of that? I think there's a few that come to mind right off the bat. Like, um, one thing that's important to acknowledge that a lot of people, um, you know, the average quote unquote Canadian, again, I'm not Canadian, I'm Anishinaabe, and finding out what that means is important too. But um, there's like this ideology that everything is like pan indigenous, you know, and all of our experiences will be very similar or the same, you know. But I acknowledge that growing up, in the city as an Ojibwe man, you know, and growing into who I am today is going to be different than someone who is in a northern community or in an isolated community. And um, I ended up losing my way for a bit, you know, and I'm pretty transparent about that. Where I, like, where I had this gift, I let my anger take control of a lot of things. And that was the biggest challenge for me is that I was just so upset because A, I didn't know where I was from. 
My father was a part of the 60s scoop. I have family members that attended residential school and it took me 25 years to meet my family. You know, within that 25 year period, um, not giving a lot of power to it. I was involved in gang life for three years of my life. I made some very severe mistakes and, um, you know, using drugs and alcohol actively, it all became a part of this anger. I was angry at myself. I was angry at everyone else around me. And that was a really, really big challenge that I had to correct and I had to come to terms with. Um, now, living sober, walking in a Nishin way, walking that red road, um, I'm, I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, because when we have challenges that aren't really like, like other people addition them towards us and we're only like dealing with things internally and trying to navigate that in our own way, it can be very difficult to stay creative and to stay uh, optimistic and positive in those certain uh, situations. Um, but that's, that's the personal one. The second one that I wanted to talk about is uh, lateral violence. Um, this is something that stems from that divide and conquer method on like pinning people against each other. And um, I, I still face it. You know, it's the unfortunate part is that if somebody sees somebody else that's succeeding, they would much rather pull them down as opposed to lift them up, you know? And I, I see it time and time again, even in the industry, uh, I see it in the, the Ottawa community. And it's so much that I had to step out and I had to come out to Saskatoon where I'm at right now, I'm in Treaty 6 territory, um, just to kind of get away and to refocus and to be creative in that way. But I think that's definitely a big one that a lot of artists and musicians and, and bands face as a whole, um, because we're being vulnerable in a way of putting ourselves out there, you know, putting our experiences out there through music. I know personally, I'm always writing about things that I've been through, uh, things that I've seen along this journey, and I'm trying to, to bring light to the situation or to bring awareness about it. And um, there's gonna be people out there that are gonna say what they're gonna say about it. Some are going to be positive, some are going to be negative, but there's times where it feels like the negatives are outweighing the positives and that ends up being a challenge all in itself, right? And I know you're very open and, and transparent about you know, your life mm -hmm. before music, so to speak, um, and, and when things were on the more negative side as opposed to the positive. Did you find, and, and I don't, mean to pry or talk about anything that you're not comfortable with but in terms of knowing that you know, that's the life that at one time that you had lived and I know you've been sober for I want to say six years eight, eight, eight years. for eight years which is absolutely amazing and wonderful but in that transition from that kind of lifestyle that was more negative into being sober for eight years into creating music into creating a positive space for individuals what were some of the did you face any kind of assumptions or stereotypes and i think you know you touched on that even in school having long hair um in that transition from you know not being sober to being sober and and creating music and pursuing that route um in your life were there any kind of stereotypes or assumptions that people held that how do i say it were challenging or created barriers? Yeah, like the big one, you know, and I, I've, I've had people, I won't give power to who exactly it was, but once a gang member, always a gang member, you know, like you get labeled just because you made a mistake at a certain point in your life. And that's something that people end up throwing in your face almost, you know, and you're trying your best to, to, to change things and to make amends because in recovery, that's the one thing that I've learned is that we're constantly saying sorry. We're constantly making amends and, and trying to move forward in that way. Um, again, like the, the stereotype of indigenous people, you know, again, this pan and indigenous ideology, indigenous people are all drug addicts and alcoholics. They would rather make themselves feel comfortable with that ideation as opposed to truly looking into who we are. You know, everybody struggles, everybody is facing challenges and trauma that they're carrying but where are the supports rather than just continually throwing these stereotypes at our people including myself where are the supports if you're going to talk about it in a negative way what are you going to do to contribute to the positive right and that's often what i'm challenging people on but 
I think those are like the, the two big ones that I've faced personally in, in, in my life and in, in my walk. It might be different for somebody else, but I know that those are the two big ones that stand out to me. And I'm constantly over here like, you don't know me then, you know, you don't know me. You haven't taken the time to have a discussion with me, to talk with me, to sit down and to actually understand what makes Cody, Cody, you know, and that, that's that kind of level that I feel a lot of people need to come to. It's just to have a discussion with each other, be open with each other, have an open heart and open mind and uh, we'll start to see some change happen, right? Absolutely. And I think we are starting to see more compassion, maybe. I don't, I'm not sure if that's the right word, but people are starting to become more aware of history. I always, I, I try and talk about things are the way that they are for a reason. There's a past to it. There are reasons for it. And the complete lack of awareness around even something like the Indian Act. People, it's legal racism. That's what that document is. And it is something that has been around for decades now. And I don't think that people are, I, I think people are starting to connect the dots in terms of intergenerational trauma, in terms of cultural identity, in terms of reclaiming who we are as Indigenous peoples. I think although the conversations can be very frustrating, they're starting and I and I hope that they're um, moving forward in a way that's positive for all of us. I know that and and this is kind of a sad note but I do I listen to everybody's music on here and uh, the one um, oh my goodness uh, one of your songs Cody don't give up on on one of your albums that Oh, I could cry thinking about it. That one helped me so much through multiple friends' suicides. I would just lie on the kitchen floor and listen to it and cry, and it would help me heal. It would help me you know, realize that we're we're spreading messages amongst ourselves. We're being we're we're able to start having and expressing these tough conversations and the tough situations that we're in on a much more happy note <laughs> since um you know since launching your songs since putting out an album i think you came out with music video a music video a couple weeks ago so in the last while uh pick your time you know what are some of your big your moments that you are super proud of and moments where you thought oh my gosh like that like you said at one point this is real this is achievable i think like you know, like outside the realm of like awards and stuff like that. I, again, first and foremost, thank you for sharing that. I acknowledge that. It means a lot to, to hear that feedback, you know, and that I was able to help in some way. Because um, really quick side note, like I wish that I had that for me when I was going through what I was going through, you know. And there's artists that I turned to, um, again, giving a shout out to Yaya and Chelsea, you know, like Porchlight, like songs like this that like are really powerful and stand out you know we we find a way that we can lift each other out of the, the darkness that we're in you know in those circumstances and um again like me miigwech for sharing that um positive note yeah so uh gonna win in Dizawin, which means self-reliance and now Ojibwe. um i came across this and i've just been learning language and reclaiming that part of who i am right and like we ended up shooting this music video out in San Diego and it was just this really cool project that my partner and I got to work on together. And uh, we filmed that with an iPhone eight and just being able to like have that self-reliance and like initiate a message of that was, was really powerful. And I am grateful for that accomplishment. Um, but another one like prior to pandemic, being able to go into juvenile detention centers and to talk with, those who have made some very severe mistakes, you know, and uh, choices along their journey. For me, I felt that's where, where I need to be, you know, more of that, because that's where that road was leading for me. You know, as much as I love performing at festivals and, you know, these showcases and stuff like that, um, at the end of the day, what I want to do with this journey that I'm on is go into these detention centers in our communities where people are hurting and, um, really shift the, the narrative, right? And empower people who have both been affected by crime and who have done crime to utilize their voice, to either make amends 
to heal, whatever the case may be. And um, quick, quick little story with that is without saying names and specifics, there was one person, there was a change that happened there. You know, from when I first went in there and they didn't know their culture, they didn't know anything about that. Growing up in the city, like I did, making the same wrong choices that I did, but getting caught, finding their voice, writing about their experiences and poetry, turning it into a song, uh, beating, starting to do crafts, those sorts of things. It had to start somewhere, you know, and it's like, here are the tools. You get to choose what you're going to do now, you know, but that, for me, that was one of the most important accomplishments that I've had. And again, that was prior to the pandemic. So, yeah. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. In, you know, talking about all these heavy topics and, and being able to be where we are in many ways, we are very behind in conversation as a whole, as Canada as a whole, I think. I think amongst Indigenous peoples, we are very, very, very far ahead of everybody else in a lot of ways. Um, in With that in mind and with the mixture of culture, tradition, uh, practices that were used by ancestors and modern 2020 you know, electronic, I, sorry, I can't remember how you described your music. Hip hop electronic. <laughs> Hip hop electronic. So in that, what were some of the things, whether they were good or bad, um, what are some of the things that you like doing about it? What are some, are there any challenges in it? Kind of that, you know, in in this day and age as Indigenous peoples, a lot of our worlds collide. Um, but in terms of, of music, can you talk a little bit about that? I just love, like, making an idea come to life. And ideas are sacred. I don't share my ideas with anybody. That's, like, that's my, you know, until I'm ready to make them come to life. Because people will do what they, they will with an idea, right? But if you take an experience and you give life, to it and you're taking that power back if that experience was negative i think that's a very moving uh, place to be but for me like I, I love writing i love the creative process that i have uh, i've got to connect with a lot of really really cool people along the journey i've got people that are in kazakhstan i've got people that are in atlanta like all over the globe and the internet is beautiful for that especially in the hip-hop realm because there's so many producers out there there's so many songwriters so many different people that we can connect with and um, if somebody sends me a beat and they're like, here, check this out, and I'm digging it, then, like, I just go, I find myself in um, a nice, quiet room, if I can. I put in the headphones, and away we go, you know, and it's just like that, that constant medicine, just being able to, to channel it somewhere, right? Um, but for me, like, yeah, that's, that's definitely a big bonus and a big plus, and I hope that uh, helps contribute to what was asked. Absolutely, and I'm, I'm always trying to... I think that that language and not necessarily, you know, how we speak to each other, what words we decide to use are so important. Uh, I, I very much hound the media and I feel I, I just had this weird bitter taste in my mouth. I just felt like a reporter that had no clue what who they were talking to because I just asked basically, how does it feel to mix two different worlds? And that's our whole life. I feel uh, once that question left my mouth, that felt really weird. So I guess it's more, you know, we should be able to create space to create new things, exactly as Elizabeth was talking about. We shouldn't keep ourselves contained in these little, um, little boxes. And since I've been talking to artists already, it's like, you know, the way I ask questions and, and the way that, you, you know, what we talk about, I think is it's super important but I just wanted to point out I felt weird asking that and that shouldn't have been the question the question I guess it, it would be more can you talk to us a little bit more about the creative process and how it's important that we don't restrict ourselves to a certain type of music or a certain style or you know people do get known for things but that's not to say that you can't do other things so I guess more on for people that are looking at trying something new or starting something new, Indigenous peoples, Indigenous youth, is there any kind of message you would like to to give to them or any advice? Yeah, like today is our day. Tomorrow is our day. 
yesterday was our day. You know, now is the time for us to mobilize. I'm, you know, on a personal note, like, yeah, like I'm really thankful that we, we have our own category and certain award shows and stuff, but why do we have to be niche? Why is it indigenous? Nah, 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 nah. You know, why aren't we good enough in the eyes of these folks who are creating these award shows to be in these regular categories? You know, like breaking down those barriers and adding to the, the, the comment that you said about like news articles. Like, if you truly look, anybody, this goes for everyone, if you look, at news articles and the headlines. See how they word things about indigenous people and then look at how they word things about non-indigenous people. That's the problem that we're facing, you know? And it's like, hey, we're throwing them little things here and there, you know, we're doing a good job. No, it needs to be active, you know? So for our young people, um, both indigenous and non-indigenous, this goes for everybody. Believe in your voice, give power to your voice. Know that it can move mountains and it can shape the future in the specific and beautiful way that we want it to be. You know, it's, it's in our hands, especially right now. We're all in this pandemic, this, this time where we're understanding that place of humanity and coming to a place of being human and understanding each other and helping each other, right? Now is the time to have those difficult discussions. Now is the time to really advocate for people's voices. If you see an article that's written by an indigenous person, you know, or any BIPOC person, share that article. Share that article, give power to it, elevate the voices of those who have been continuously oppressed under that Indian Act, under colonial laws and structures, you know, really breaking it down and building something beautiful up together. But that would be the biggest part that I would say is just give power to your voice, understand that there are people out there that are willing to listen, that are gonna support it, you know, and don't be, apologetic for doing it it's time to kick down the doors time to break down those structures i'm talking about and again building something beautiful up together so look at you. Oh, thanks cody i really love that i'm i'm all about let's recreate normal let's have a new normal we've seen the injustices and inequalities we do not need to go back mm -hmm. we are in a perfect time to move forward to progress together on that note, would you like to share a little bit, give us a little bit of taste of, of your music? Yeah, yeah, I'm down. Um, I could do an acapella, you know, given the, the current circumstance. All my gear is back in Ottawa, but I'll be here in Saskatoon, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, I can think of a relevant one that's uh, short and sweet here. Yeah, I, um, I wrote this piece around uh, the whole Canada 150 celebrations that were happening. I felt so awkward. I was like, whoa, this is the most weird place to be in, you know? And people can have their own opinions about it and stuff like that, but I felt awkward. Because again, coming back to what I mentioned earlier, it took me 25 years to find my family. That includes being able to connect with my family, members that are from Atachuan, uh, to speak my language, to even have any sense of a cultural identity, uh, language, ceremony, any of that, right? And um, it comes from a song called 300 Reconciliation. Um, yeah, let's get into it. 150 years full of genocide. 150 years that our people cry. 150 years try and kill our pride. 150 years that our people die. 1876, Indian Act, changing the ways that the Indians act. Eliminate, eradicate, hold the Indian packs, take the land and create an Indian tax. Assimilate, never bringing Indians back. Murder and rape generations of them. 1763 proclamation began, now we celebrate, do it over again. Neglecting to help all the needy. Taking the leg because they're greedy, they broke in the treaties. Brainwashing you all through a TV, dividing us all because they're sneaky. I need them to free me. 150 years, no celebration. And you with me, T, in our first nation. We need to show love through education. The future is here, reconciliation. Oh, I love that. I got, you can't see, but I got goosebumps everywhere. Thank you so much for being here, Cody. And, uh, really really appreciate the time and, and the perspective I don't think it's it's something that we hear enough across Canada and and we'll hopefully be discussing it more so thank you so much for being here Cody I really appreciate it I hope. Teach me much. thank you 
our last but not least, uh, Twin Flames. Uh, I had used a, uh, a one of their songs. Chain. Oh my goodness, I'm I'm blanking right now. But I used one of your songs during campaign. I've been listening to Twin Flames for uh, much longer than that. So Highgate is my my favorite, um, and uh, just really really happy you guys are here. I don't. I'm I'm really good at looking like. I'm not excited, <laughs> especially when I'm in the House of Commons, but definitely I'm always screaming, fangirling when I, I'm like texting my mom. I just walk by Yayi and Chelsea every time we're in the same area. So I really appreciate you guys being here so much. And uh, before we launch in, if you could both just introduce yourselves and, and maybe a little bit about yourself. Oh, there we go. That would help. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Next, make. Uh, um, my name is Yai. Uh, I am uh, hailing from Huaktak. Um, I grew up in Huaktak. I, I, uh, I'm also Mohawk from Ganawagi, um, which is uh, on my biological father's side. So, uh, are you, uh, can you hear us okay? Yeah, okay. Hi, <laughs> thanks so much for having us. Um, I'm Chelsea June. I'm Métis. I'm Algonquin Cree and French Canadian. Donc je parle beaucoup en français aussi. Um, we're just, you know, this is an incredible thing that you are doing, and you do so many incredible things. So I'm totally fangirling too, uh, getting to have this moment with you and all these Cody and Elisophy. Uh, so much talent and so much passion. Um, in one panel, so to make which for having us. Oh, I really appreciate that. Uh, before I really get into anything, I guess this is a little bit more. I just want to know: um, Have you guys always created music together? No, no. we were both solo <laughs> artists and uh, met on a television show. <laughs> oh, so maybe can we talk a little bit first about the solo? your your solo careers and then maybe kind of how that how that came to be twin flames go for it you no. go first no you go first you go first <laughs> um i guess for me um i never really considered myself a musician until i'd say about 20 2014 um but admiring um my innovatics like elisabeth um you know, one of the things I, I, I truly remember is hearing some stuff that I felt, you know, were, were you know, beyond what, what, where I came from and, and hearing something that was, was, was much different than what I was used to from the uh, typical Inuktitut folk music. And I truly admired that because it was a, a style that, that was evolving from what we were used to listening. And, um, when I finally got into music, I understand um, some of the reasons why you po possibly left as well as uh, to pursue music. And um, I met for me, me leaving the North was under different circumstances. It was for family reasons. Um, but when I became a musician, um, I, I right away understood what it was to be, um, to be an artist um, and to start using the, or hearing the term ingiti. Ingiti meaning the singer, um, the artist. Um, and um, the very gigantic microscope that you are now all of a sudden a part of, where every move you make, every step you take. <laughs> I'll be watching. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, for me, at the beginning, um, you know, dealing with the 12 years of policing that I, that I endured and uh, the rest of the life that I had endured at that point as an Inuk man, um, being a Lak, indigenous uh, or Indian, little Indian as they would call me, or Halunak just because of uh, how I looked, um, those, were, those were the things that led me to be where I was at my at, at my state uh, with other stuff as well, which we won't get into, but um, the drinking, you know, as an artist, uh, it was very easy to be that artist because now 
you have become this walking, flying, driving jukebox that people are hiring to go to your community to sing that that one song possibly eight times in that one night because they want to hear it over and over, um, which has happened. <laughs> and uh, you get fed the alcohol. You you start to go spiraling down very fast. And that was my my first couple of months when I became an artist in 2014. Um, I found myself right away um, one one particular festival where um, I'm singing my song and I'm looking at the people singing and their lips are moving differently than what I'm singing. And I very fast realized that they know the songs that I wrote more than I do because for me, it was just an excuse to go up there on stage and sing something. And I wasn't even singing. And the angayatik, which is the drunk, the the womanizer and stuff like that starting to pop out. Um, you know, I, I very, very fast felt as though I was lying in the words that I was writing about. Um, so, yeah, and I think that in, in, in that, along that line is when I have met my wife. Yeah. We met in Quebec City uh, in Wendaki. Uh, it was during a television show, Tam Tala Autochton Musical. And it was uh, showcasing Indigenous artists from across Canada. And uh, being Métis myself, um, I grew up in Ottawa like Cody, and I didn't have any access to my culture. Um, you know, my mom would always tell me, Titin Bele Indian, you're, we're beautiful Indians, uh, because that was a term that she grew up with and that was still used, you know. So identity for me was always something that was very difficult. Um, was living in in two worlds, but not really understanding what the indigenous world was. And I think being Métis within that is even more complex because my exterior is white. So as well, you know, when you mentioned having to people asking about your tattoos, well, people always ask me, how are you indigenous? How are you Métis? There's no way, there's no way. And for me, it's hurtful because we come from rape culture, right? And many of the women in my family had no choice in what our exterior would be. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm at a point in my life where I've reclaimed everything that was taken away uh, from my grandmother, from my mother, the things that we should have been allowed to grow up with. And um, I just have to love all the parts that make me. You know, I feel right now we're at a place where there's so much divide and it's almost like we have to choose a side and um, that wouldn't be honoring who I am as a human being. So when we met on that show, I kind of sidetracked, but um, I had started songwriting um, just as a way to let out everything that I had in my heart. Because in my life, I, I suffered a lot with uh, mental health issues and um, self-esteem issues and social anxiety. And to have conversations or speak to people was something I never thought I'd be able to do, let alone sing in front of an audience. So writing to that piece of paper kind of became my one way of releasing everything. And um, having lived a life in addictions and being sober for 14 years, um, when I started songwriting in, in, in and around the same time as Yai in 2014, um, I had already begun my healing journey. So a lot of the songs I was writing at that time was, how can I help somebody that might feel some of the things that I've gone through in my life? Because I believe within our suffering, it's never for nothing. If we can find whatever lesson or find whatever strength lies within us and transfer that knowledge, then it means it wasn't for nothing. And uh, so when Yai and I met um, around a campfire during that television show screening, he was singing a cover song that I knew. And so even though I was shaking and I was so nervous because I'd never even been around musicians in my life, um, I just joined in singing and our voices did this instant harmony. Um, where we both kind of looked back. We didn't even know each other's names. And it was like, wow, as if music can be this awesome. Um, so a few months later, he came to visit in Ottawa. 
um, then he just moved in and uh, I never let him leave after that but I don't think he wanted to leave either <laughs> and uh, yeah we started our musical journey together and um, you know when we first met I was already sober and living a life in recovery and yeah he was still drinking um, but he made that decision on his own to quit because I realized with addictions um, of any kind, you can never be forced to do anything. The person has to take that responsibility and truly want it um, when it's the time. And so I'm so proud of him. You know, it's been six years that he's living his life um, and just the growth as a, as a human being and the healing that he's done on his journey. Um, I'm just honored to be witness to. I love that. Someone needs to make a movie. You guys can be the next notebook or something. <laughs> was my favorite movie. Elizabeth, Elizabeth is going to be the director. <laughs> awesome. Um, so, so since then, and thank you both so much for sharing. I know it's, it's never easy to talk about. I, I try really hard to keep my my work life and my personal life separate, which can be impossible sometimes, but, you know, to be able to share those, those struggles and to have healed that much to do that. I think it's something that is so powerful in itself. Uh, from that, since you guys have started creating music together, what, what did that process, can you walk us a little bit through how that started, if things changed, how you guys kind of, how, a little bit, I guess, of the journey of learning how to work together and, you know, some of the things that worked better or not so much. I, I would love to hear about what that looked like at the beginning and how that's evolved. The learning to, to do it together is still ongoing, but in a, <laughs> in a, in a harmonious way. Um, More harmonious now. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, because um, my brain works a little bit different than hers and I think a lot of that is is kind of touching on what uh, Elizabeth had said earlier where um, the lyrics of the song tend to kind of uh, develop from what the instrument is saying if I play it like I'm, I'm, I'm the melody melody in, in in this the creator of the melody and, and Chelsea's obviously the stronger songwriter um, but in the end I think uh, just kind of like coming up with a melody. If 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 I can't necessarily uh, express what I want to, and often um, it, there's really never any language. And that's one thing that I've always been really uh, focused on is that um, I don't focus on the language. Um, I focus on the music, um, regardless of where you come from. Even though I am proud of of my my uh, mother tongue, I, I I I'm I'm honored to be able to sing in my language everywhere I go in the world. Um, bottom line is music does not have uh, a language it, it, it is what it is and I often gravitate towards the music part and then um, in in all of this I think um, when when Chelsea starts to to sing something you know I may stick to that language she's starting in whether it's in English or French and then or have that interweaving like Elizabeth had said earlier and I think it's just to be able to ensure that the listener is being taken on a journey um, because that's what music is to us. It's, it's, it's a soundtrack to our, our own life and our storytelling and um, the conversation that it brings because it may be about the hard topics that we as Inuit people or indigenous people have had to endure over time. Um, and uh, I think it's just about making sure that the listener doesn't feel responsible because at the end of the day, um, the world is very big and not everybody is bad in it. Yeah, I, I think we've, we've kind of learned too along the way um, how to work more together. Uh, in the beginning, it was really difficult because my brain is very structured based and what is, what is the intent and what, it, what do I want the listener to feel or what am I trying to convey in what I'm saying? And uh, so I think it, it, we've been a, a healthy balance uh, between the two of us and, and really learned how to work better together. Uh, we were both only children as well, so <laughs> we had to learn how to share. But uh, 
Yeah, I, I think one of the things that I find super fascinating about our relationship uh, in music is that um, I don't understand Inuktitut, but I'm able to sing in, in the language and I, I just, I have this infinite love for the language. Um, and my brain, I guess, hears it in a way differently than if I were to speak it. And one of the things that's so cool is, yeah, you can start writing a song, just singing and playing his guitar, singing in Inuktitut. And then I come in in English in an emotion that I'm feeling and I, I just start singing. And then after he'll be like, how did you know? Like, how did you know what I was saying? And I didn't. It's just that connection or that feeling that music can make people feel subconsciously. Uh, it's just, it's so powerful. And um, I just always grateful that, that this gets to be our life and our real job because I never thought that, like Elisabeth, I never thought being a musician or an artist could be a job, you know. Growing up in Ottawa, you get a government job, you get the husband, the white picket fence, and you follow all those steps. And that's the key to happiness. But I did all of that and I was very unhappy. So letting all of it go, breaking down the boxes that society tries to put us in is, is where I've found my happiness. Absolutely. And that's something that I, I struggled with for a long time, why I didn't like school, why it didn't sit right with me. And everybody around me had that checklist. I get a house, I get a job, I get my white picket fence, I have, and I'm like, I have more that I want to do than that. Like, our, there's, there's, the, the world gives us such unlimited options to be creative in so many different ways and it's 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 a lot more fun sometimes when we don't abide by those assumptions that this is how life goes and that's never actually how it works out uh, with your music as as twin flames uh, each of you I'd love to hear a couple of examples or, or stories that really stick out for you, whether it's a place you went to, you never thought you'd go to, maybe somebody you met, um, moments from, from your career together that really just, for whatever reason, stick out. Um, I mean, there's so much to choose from um, because, you know, we didn't expect that we were going to be doing this for a living and seeing all the places and going on all, all parts of the world with what, 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 what we're doing. Um, it's, it's obviously humbling. Um, I think uh, something that is current, at, at least I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that, is a young man, a young man in uh, Nunavut. Um, he, had, uh, he had been to our show, in one of our shows, um, where he was working. And um, after, after we had gone, gone home he started to message and then say I'd like to come and visit to the hotel to the hotel um and we were like okay like we we try to generally not um invite people into our personal lives just because we we just meet so many people on on the on the set and uh when we travel uh so we try to keep that part of it more personal um but he had a story. He, he really, you know, he gravitated towards one of the songs and he said uh, that, you know, it saved his life. Um, he, uh, he mentioned that when he was, uh, when he was uh, 10 years old, his, his father had committed suicide. And so for him, he felt like um, having listened to the song and seeing the, the reactions of people um, that gravitate towards our songs, uh, you know, he felt like, you know, he was really appreciative that he, he's able to listen to that and other people are able to listen to what we create. And he said, I really, really want to come by. Um, I have a guitar for you. Um, I'd really love to give you the guitar because this guitar didn't do it for me. I was, I, I tried, I tried, I gave it, gave it to my little brother. He just wanted to play hockey. I just want to play hockey too, but I want you to take this guitar. And we said, no, no, I, I can't, I, I can't, I don't feel good about it. And so um, he said, I want you to create, something with this guitar and um, I want you to continue to do what you do and write so um, we said okay come by um, well, I won't promise that I'll take it but come by let's have a chat and so he came by and he visited for about an hour and and uh, he still managed to bring the guitar and, um, 
I couldn't refuse it. Uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, I ended up, uh, you know, taking it and, uh, following that, uh, that visit, um, I think within a week we had a song created and it's a song called Pisipunga. Um, it's a song that, that, that is going to be released on our, our upcoming album in August. And, you know, it, it, it's kind of inspired by, by how, you know, sometimes, uh, even just going for a walk, de depending on, 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 on where you are in your life and what you're doing, you know, just that helps, you know, to focus and refocus and to listen to something. And that's, that, that's what the power of music has. When you listen to somebody singing, uh, you automatically assume that they're writing about you because it's so relative. And you're saying to yourself, oh my God, that's my song. And, and that's what the power of music has. And, um, you know, it, what more can I say to what music does? And I think everybody can relate. Yeah. And you wrote that song on his guitar that he gave you. Yes. Full circle. Yeah. Sorry, I'm... <laughs> ADHD, <laughs> attention deficit and high definition. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he was an incredible young man. You know, there, there are just so many uh, people that we have met on this journey. Uh, it's so hard to pick one, but I think one of my most incredible moments that I've gotten to live in this lifetime is being accepted by Inuit. Um, in the beginning, it was tough. We would go to Nunavik um, and they would say, in Inuktitut, we don't want her on the stage. And he would be like, well, we you paid for her ticket to come up here and perform. And they would say, we don't care. Uh, she's Halunak, we don't want her on the stage. And in the beginning, it really hurt. But then I, I understood the more time that I spent in communities, how much pain that my exterior represented in those communities. And I realized that it wasn't about me, it was about something so much bigger. And so we continued to tour uh, in Nunavik and um, he continued to stand up and, and say, you know, just give her a chance and they would. And I'll be forever grateful for that because, you know, if we were in a community and we would play the festival they'd want us to play all five nights it's like are you not sick of hearing us yet <laughs> but you know the first night it'd be like stone cold faces you know in the audience but then the second night more smiles and then the third night the kids were singing along like even to songs that i had written and fourth night fifth night by the time we left we were family you know and um in nunavut as well like having toured there extensively like um my nickname that I have been given is Ukwak, which is in-law to the north. And, you know, as human beings, I think the fact that a group of people can be hurt so much by another race, but still have that space in their heart to open, open it up, um, that's something I'm, I'm forever grateful for. And I, I still get emotional about it. But every time I stand on stage in the north, I'm grateful because I realize that I, I don't, I don't need a place up there, you know, but I am welcomed up there. And, and that's something that is, is beyond anything I can imagine. <laughs> I love that. Thank you both for sharing. I really appreciate it. And it, even, you know, just listening to this conversation, it's hard not to choke up and tear up because what we're talking about, it's so real for each and every one of us, sometimes in different ways, but in a lot of ways very very similar and when you look yeah. at the history for indigenous peoples when you look at even our own personal what, what we've experienced growing up where we are now what we continue to experience is still so in in a lot of ways so similar uh even though it's not identical and i really appreciate you both both sharing uh just uh we are a little bit over time which is perfectly fine i've really really enjoyed these this conversation it's been so powerful and so so heartwarming and uh, uh yaya and chelsea is there do you want to give us a little bit a taste of of something before we we say goodbye i don't know what do you want to do a cappella <sighs> no i'll speak up with the tires right there <laughs> what do you want to do right there uh, she she uh 
She was talking about so high it as uh, oh, as one of her favorites, yeah. And if there's snorting happening, it's not me farting or breathing funny, it's it's actually our dog. <laughs> <laughs> And while you guys get settled there, so Kaigit is my favorite by Twin Flames. I'm going to have to go with Ogema with, for Cody Coyote. I love that song. And uh, Elisabeth, I'm going to have to go Angnak. 100. I was singing it. I, I had a really fun, <clears throat> that was that super sarcastic tone for me. I had a really fun afternoon. And as I was getting ready for this, that's what I was yelling slash singing in, in, in the washroom as I was getting ready. really love those songs. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, uh, I feel very spoiled right now. I just got my little, little show here with everyone. Oh, I love it. I appreciate you all for coming on. Thank you all both. So all both, all four of you so much. I really cool. appreciate the time and it's been an amazing, amazing conversation. And I really look forward to watching your careers grow and, and where they lead you next. Um, maybe just to, to wrap up, Elizabeth, is there, is there anything that you would like to say just before we close? Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm very emotional. I'm, it's, 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 very, it's very rich. Um, and I think that's what we have to be given a chance to share. And we don't hear enough of us um, because we're... It's, it's, I'm very, I'm very moved by what you guys talked about, um, the beautiful stories that, you know, like what we go through as musicians, uh, what we witness, what people share to us, it's, you can only be humbling. And I think, yeah, you, what you said about songs is you write them, but they no longer belong to you. That's the beauty of music is mm -hmm. they belong to everybody. And yeah, so it's very, so, yeah, so rich. Our lives are very rich and full of stories. Nakor uh, Memorial for sharing. Very beautiful what you said too about Inuit and you know how you feel you are accepted now. And I think it's a process, I think, um, the the road that we have to take, the process of that is more actually beautiful than when we actually get to where we want it to be because, yeah, because we're moving all the time. Nakomi, Cody, for sharing. I, I was so moved with what you said about so many things. Uh, how an idea is sacred, that is so true. I think we are in a world where we overly um, we overly think 
and we always think an idea i have to write it down or record it but an idea is so sacred that it will if it's meant to be there if it's true it's probably come back tomorrow and the next day so that's really my process sometimes trying to have um to understand that songs or whatever has to come will come when the moment will be the right moment when things are going to be aligned so beautiful we're so proud of you and i was i felt like a i don't know like i felt i was so star starstruck when you reached out and you wanted to talk to me i'm like and my managers were like they're like okay so yeah what's going on i'm like i don't know she wants to talk to me it's it's because we're you you speak up you speak the truth without ever saying i'm sorry you know because yeah it's sometimes it's good to say i'm sorry but i think we have to learn to just speak and be fierce and strong and that's okay as women even more so you know we have to defend our children our communities so it's very very empowering to see you to be with you oh, thank you so much elizabeth i really appreciate it we were joking around when i was messaging her because i met we met back in 2013 and my dad was so jealous and I was <laughs> telling her, you know, he'll, he'll be super jealous about this too. So uh, really appreciate you being here and, and your super kind words, Elizabeth. Thank you. Cody, was there anything that you would like to, to say before we wrap up here? I had to unmute it. I almost forgot about that. Jeez. <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to say, uh, you know, once again, thank you for bringing us all together and allowing a space for us to just have that open dialogue about such important topics. Elisipi, um, for your kind words and again for sharing. Yai, uh, Chelsea, you know, and I am just so appreciative, like, what everybody is doing in this circle right now. That's how we're gonna see the shift that we're talking about. That's how we're gonna see that positive light come to this situation. And um, I'm excited. I'm like, yo, I've been in pandemic, I'm like isolating, I've been staying myself, kind of going crazy a little bit, but now I get to see old friends and new, we get to hang out and like, just really talk about important things, you know? Mm -hmm. So again, kitch me, but thank you. And uh, let's do it again. Jeez, yes. do it again, straight up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so fun. Thank you so much, Coyote. I almost keep saying Coyote. I don't know why. I've always called you Cody. And I think it's just the Cody Coyote kind of really rolls off nicely. Maybe that's it. Um, thank you so much, Cody, for being here. Really appreciate it. And sharing. You shared some really, really heavy stuff and really important things. And, and it's important that we talk about it. And it's so important that we see especially indigenous men that can heal and that have healed and are helping other people heal. It is so, so important that we see that. So thank you so much for sharing and for being here. Thanks. Oh, Thanks, Cody. Twin flames, Chelsea and Yadi, is there anything that you'd like to, I just realized you're wearing a Reese's Pieces. Is that a Reese's Pieces shirt? It is, but I was wearing orange because I was representing. Yes. <laughs> represent. Oh, I don't even have orange on. Oh, no. I'm wearing it for the both of us. For all of us. For all Great. of us. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, just Hoyanami, thank you for having us. Um, this is amazing. It's, it's an honor to be here with with all of you in this in the same space and i think it's just that that's the way forward is is having more indigenous voices heard and uh having more platforms in which we can be heard but also eventually not needing those platforms as cody had touched on where we're just accepted and in those same spaces as other canadian artists um, i know that's definitely a dream for for yai and i and uh we thank you for giving us this space. One of the things that we hope to see as uh, Indigenous artists uh, is that, you know, we talk about how it is in the, in the non-Indigenous world, how we are treated by industry. But the, one of the things that we fail to mention is how we treat in, each other within the Indigenous industry. Um, you know, s since 2015, you know, there's been a huge shift from what we experience you know, in some places where we, we are treated as if we've, we've uh, seen it all and done it all. But 
uh, in the beginning, it was not necessarily like that, you know, and, and that it's very, still very cutthroat. And we still have people that unfortunately sometimes don't like having their seats taken and will treat us a certain way. And, you know, this has to stop, you know, lateral violence is not just within uh, different cultures. It's also within the same. And I think that's one thing that we, we wish and hope because for us, when we see an indigenous person up there on stage, you know, person up there on stage, you know, we, we, we raise our hands and say, wow, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's our people. It's a win for all of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Me. <laughs> now it's my mute that isn't working. Thank you all again so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the discussion. And uh, I think this is something, you know, we look back at and we say, hmm, the discussion actually started changing more so there too. And, and hopefully we see periods of that that, that start to happen, uh, not just as indigenous peoples, not just in music, but in all on all different levels for all different kinds of people. So thank you all so much for being here. Really appreciate it. And I'm so excited for everyone's future. Thanks everyone. Bye, Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.